Welcome to everybody. Welcome to this uh, webinar. Um, I'm Bob Poland, and I am going to be the moderator for the webinar. Uh, the webinar is about to discuss this just published book, Busting the Bankers Club, Finance for the Rest of Us. The author is, of course, Jerry Epstein, professor of economics and co-director of the Political Economy Research Institute. Jerry is my close co-worker and close friend here at UMass and at Perry, so I'm very happy to be moderating. Friendship aside, I am sure I'm speaking objectively when I say that Busting the Bankers Club is an outstanding book. It is an extremely valuable contribution both to knowledge in general and to advancing the ongoing fight for social and economic justice. The book is a highly unusual combination. It's a serious analysis of the wide range of malignancies associated with what Jerry calls roaring banking. And it does so in a way that is accessible and even sometimes entertaining for non-specialists. Jerry then develops an equally wide ranging and clear analysis of the work of what he terms the club busters the people, organizations, and movements that are fighting to create a financial system that can help build a more equal, fair, and ecologically sane U.S. economy. We're fortunate to have an eminent group of panelists to provide their perspectives on Jerry's book and the broader set of issues that it raises. I'm going to provide now some brief background on our panelists, so, and I won't interrupt the discussion further as we proceed. Our first speaker will be Jerry himself. Jerry will then be followed by Christine Dessan. Christine is the Leo Gottlieb Professor of Law at Harvard Law School and co-director of the Program on the Study of Capitalism at Harvard. She is the author, among many other works, of Making Money, Coin Currency, and the Coming of Capitalism. Dean Baker. Dean, Another close friend is a senior economist and co-founder of the Center for Economic and Policy Research, CEPR. His many works include Rigged, How Globalization and the Rules of the Modern Economy Were Structured to Make the Rich Richer. Dean also writes the well-known and widely read blog, Beat the Press. Jennifer Tao. Jennifer is professor of law at Western New England University School of Law, as well as a political activist. Jennifer's research focuses on banking reform, corporate governance, financial market regulation, white collar crime, and the 2008 financial crisis. Her books include Big Dirty Money and Other People's Home Houses. Lisa Donner. Lisa is the executive director of Americans for Financial Reform. This is one of the two, maybe three most important and effective organizations fighting to build a more productive and just US financial system. Prior to this, Lisa was at various times executive director of the Anti-Poverty Project Half in 10 campaign, co-director of the Center for Working Families, and an organizer for the Service Employees International Union, SEIU. Each speaker will have 10 minutes, and I'm going to keep strictly to the limits. We will then have 20 minutes for some question and answers and responses by all the panelists. If you would like to ask a question, please write it through the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen. Send in the questions at any time, but we will uh, cover them at the end of the discussion in the last 20 minutes. So I'm now going to turn it over to Jerry Epstein. Thanks, Bob. And uh, thanks to everyone for joining this webinar book launch of Busting the Bankers Club, Finance for the Rest of Us, published by University of California Press, which, by the way, is a terrific press for any of you who are thinking of publishing books. I want to especially thank our panelists who've taken time out of their very busy schedules to speak about our problematic financial system and what we can do to make it work better for society. My book is about the outsized power of finance in the US, economically and politically. I ask, how does this finance industry, especially the mega banks like JP Morgan Chase, Bank of America, 
sustain their economic and political power and sustain their huge incomes of their CEOs and their major investors. Despite threatening major financial crises every decade or so, while demanding government bailouts on a frequent basis. Some argue that these financial titans are so big and powerful because they provide such valuable services to our economy that these bankers are, in other words, essential workers. But busting the bankers club shows that these mega banks, private equity firms, hedge funds, et cetera, are on balance a net drain on our economy. This is because of their misallocation of human and financial resources, the frequent financial crises they cause, and the outsized profits and incomes they extract from society. By the way, this analysis and a lot of the underlying research in the book comes from my joint research with excellent current and former graduate students from UMass Amherst Economics. So how do these financiers sustain their power and wealth? The answer is the Bankers Club. This is the powerful group of allies that the bankers cultivate and motivate to promote the interests of finance in Washington, state capitals, and around the country. My book details these club members and shows how and why they promote the power of finance. Note how important this is uh, for the bankers themselves. Survey after survey shows how unpopular banks are to Americans. Every year I challenge my undergraduate students to come up with a Hollywood movie that portrays bankers in a positive light. The closest they get is, it's a wonderful life. And that's from 1946. The Bankers Club includes some regular suspects, the banks and financial institutions and the politicians that they, that they pay off to protect them, to write helpful legislation and to appoint finance friendly regulators. But there are other members who might be more surprising. Take for instance, the Federal Reserve. I call the Federal Reserve the chairman of the club. The Fed sees the world through finance colored glasses with its monetary policy tools, its regulations and its lender of last resort actions. The Fed often puts the interests of finance ahead of those of society at large. We saw this with the financial bailouts after the great financial crisis. And we have seen this again in the recent high interest rate policies of the Fed. Other key members of the club include many financial regulatory agencies and lawyers that work for them or directly for the banks. Then there's the CEOs of non-financial corporations who often side with the banks. This, this is different from the Great Depression when many turned against the banks themselves. And there are all too many in my own profession, economists, who fashion theories based on flimsy assumptions that formalize, that rationalize financial deregulation while claiming that free markets are the best of all possible worlds. This club, at the cost of millions of dollars, dismantled the New Deal financial regulations that were the foundation of a relatively stable and efficient, though highly discriminatory, post-World War II financial system. Some called it boring banking. This deregulation ushered in our current system of, as Bob said, current roaring banking. Now, what holds this bankers club together? It's a nexus of payoffs. Financial institutions give campaign contributions to politicians and offers them and their staffs lucrative jobs when they leave office. <clears throat> Financial firms hire economic consultants and sometimes gives money to friendly economics departments and programs. The banks create a revolving door of well-paying jobs for Federal Reserve and regulatory officials and their staffs who shuttle between private and public employment. How is all this financed? Through what I call the circuit of wealth grabbing. To some extent, this is a self-sustaining process where the bankers club is paid off from the profits financial institutions make from deregulation and a fav favorable accounting and legal rules. Undergirding much of this, is the money spigot. This includes government and Federal Reserve bailout, Federal Reserve liquidity support, and, and finance-friendly monetary policy that enhances profits and sustains the real value of financial assets. There's also finance-friendly tax laws that enhance profits and wealth. Underlying the circuit further, something that Christine DeSan has written about, 
is the government-sanctioned private bank-based monetary system that allows private banks to create money, literally out of thin air. Some call this the Willie Sutton rule. To reform banking, we must reduce the power of the Bankers Club. And to do that, we must, among other things, plug up this money spigot. I'll return to this point a bit later. Importantly, my book is not just about the Bankers Club and the problems it creates. My book is also about the club busters, the individuals, organizations, and groups that for years have been fighting for a better financial system. The panelists here today are themselves all club busters. In writing my book, I was fortunate that many such activists and reformers were generous with their time in giving me informative interviews from which I drew heavily. Among other places, these interviews were very helpful for the last section of my book, where I detail ideas for financial restructuring and reform. I turn here first to, to the issue of improving financial regulation, still necessary, because of the weak Dodd-Frank regulations and the partial deregulation implemented under Trump. Here I emphasize four regulatory principles for enhancing financial stability, the standard goal for financial regulation. Number one, downsize and simplify the mega banks. For example, implement a modern Glass-Steagall Act. Two, greatly limit banks' financial dependence on short-term liquidity for financing long-term risky investments. Three, leave no financial institution or market unregulated, including hedge funds, derivatives, and private equity. This should include strict leverage limits and restrictions on interconnectedness among our financial institutions. Four, implement a precautionary principle with respect to financial innovation. This would limit the widespread introduction of new financial products until they can be shown to be safe and effective. So for example, keep crypto out of the core of our banking and financial system, and if anything, way out on the fringes. But regulation should do more than prevent finance from crashing our economy every decade or so. Financial regulation should have a more positive role. It should also promote a financial system that serves important social goals, such as more investment in marginalized communities, protecting workers and nursing home residents from the avarice of private equity firms, and directing more finance for the green transition. I discuss, I discuss each of these points in the book. Still, financial regulation will not be enough to make our financial system work for us all. A strictly private, for-profit financial system, no matter how well regulated, has too narrow a focus to tackle many of the problems that we face. So in addition, we need a vital system, publicly oriented financial institutions, what I call banks without bankers. Public banks, a significant network of community development financial institutions with social missions, and a thriving community of small banks. But we also need scale. These institutions have to be big enough and widespread enough to give us alternatives to the for-profit mega financial institutions. So we also need larger publicly oriented banks such as green banks, community redevelopment banks, and perhaps most importantly, a more socially oriented central bank. In that regard, we won't get a thriving ecosystem of publicly oriented banks until we have a federal reserve that supports public banking with even a small fraction of the support it gives to roaring banking. Stepping back though, I have a serious chicken and egg problem. My book argues that the Bankers Club is extremely powerful, yet I am proposing an ambitious set of changes and reforms that the club will certainly try to block. How to break this knot? The answer in my view comes down to two initiatives. First, we need to support and where possible join the club busters, make progress on some issues, pub, plug up the money spigot where we can, move along a path to better financial system. Success is likely to build on success. At least that is my hope. And second, we need to defend and support initiatives to protect doc democracy at large, including getting money out of politics and protecting the right to vote. Thankfully, there's a small army of club busters out there pushing for these and other reforms. And we are fortunate 
that we can hear from some of them right here and right now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jerry. And our next speaker will be Professor Christine Dissing. Thanks very much for the invitation to speak. Uh, this is an eye-opening book. It was a pleasure to read. Uh, the narrative is illuminating along uh, many dimensions. I'm going to pick out three and flag them briefly. I'm going to be very brief to save time for three proposals that I also want to flag where I'd love to hear more from Professor Epstein. Uh, so quickly to the three, to at least three of the dimensions on which this is so powerful. First of all, the book tells a compelling structural story that sets up and should inform banks' current role. As Professor Epstein puts it, modern banks become intermediaries within a regulated state. The deal is a lucrative role as intermediaries in return for public regulation and a recognition of public responsibility. So as he writes on the role of banking in the baseline boring banking version, commercial banks took in deposits from retail customers who left their money with the banks, which paid depositors nothing or next to nothing in interest and lent out money to businesses and households, earning a nice spread between interest paid and interest earned. Given that, uh, that profitable business, they have a social responsibility to match, which is real if imperfect. That is, banks understood uh, that they received public support of all sorts of types, clearing, federal deposit insurance, and they therefore accepted pub public regulation as public utilities, as institutions with a public mission. Imperfect to be sure, and the book um, also conveys the bias in banks' behavior throughout by race and gender for sure. But the structural story is one of social compact, the premise of boring banking, and it teaches us how banks should uh, should regard regulation. So first, powerful dimension. Secondly, the book tells a powerful political story about that deal between banks and government and its breakdown. So it takes us to politics in a contextualized way that exposes particularities, but also patterns. We learn, for example, both about specific episodes, the abuses that brought the Great Depression, the regulatory revolution in the New Deal, but also about patterns that allow us to generalize or draw out lessons that may be applied elsewhere, right? The kind of abuses we can predict, the phenomenon of bank industry solidarity and fragmentation and how we can regulate given that those um, predictable dynamics. So here, the political story extends to the resurgence of the Bankers Club after the New Deal and Professor Epstein explains how banking starts to roar in the 17 and eight, 17, 1970s and 80s as banks begin to securitize debt and market it. That takes him to a focus on financialization. Um, the wages of financialization are huge, and that takes us to a third dimension of the book, which is a distributive story. Um, Again and again, we see modern finance in the book, as uh, Professor Epstein puts it, an engine of inequality that uh, flows from many sources, including excessive in uh, incomes and profits flowing to finance, the cost from the misallocation of resources to finance, uh, the cost of bailouts. I, I did want to mention one little um, factoid that came from Jerry's research his research shows that between 1950 and 2008, lending between banks increases fivefold as opposed to lending from banks um, to other borrowers, really striking evidence in empirical work in this part of the book. Um, in short, the cost of roaring banking, he estimates at between 45 and $70 trillion. This is money that's coming ultimately from American households. And, um, Takes me to a last, uh, I'm gonna add a fourth dimension, throw it in. The book communicates powerfully and accessibly. So this is uh, a book that refuses to obfuscate. He explains terms, entities, dynamics, theories, deploys visuals with great effect. He includes an amazing appendix on the deregulatory trend. Uh, I could go on. But since we're supposed to do more than repeat and, um, and praise, I will suggest some places where I'd love to hear more. Um, and maybe these are places that would help us get to the reforms that are so necessary that Professor Epstein um, identifies. So my first proposal, he's already he's stolen my thunder on here. I wanted to hear more about banks as money creators. 
Professor Epstein engages money creation at times, for sure, chapter three and beautifully in chapter 12. But I would love to see him do more, do it earlier, maybe in another book, and do it as a matter of theory or pedagogy. The, the, this powerful trend in the scholarship that, um, that revises traditional approaches to banking sees banks rather than intermediaries as, uh, so they're not just moving money from savings savers to borrowers, but banks are also creating new credit against borrowers' assets and clearing mutual credits within banking networks. So a, um, a, a historian of banks of the, of the medieval and early modern period actually says, you know, the distinctive modern turn is not so much moving money, even moving it fast between savers and borrowers. It's discounting long-term financial commitments in the shape of private credit and then clearing that credit against other credit created by other banks and then um, all, in assimilating all of that mutually cleared credit as part of the national payment system. Other scholars take that to shadow banking. We need to go further still. But for the moment, my suggestion is just that the money creative approach changes somewhat the valence in, um, of the argument. I think it strengthens the argument of the book, right? So rather than a deal, a social contract between private and public, it identifies banking as a public delegation of sovereign authority to make money. If so, then governments aren't regulating a pre-existing activity, but actually enabling that activity, that activity, actually defining banking. So we would expect a stronger approach by government, not just a reactive regulatory approach. Um, that in turn would uh, further strengthen support for Professor Epstein's precautionary principle uh, that he uh, a principle he rightly advocates and a stronger case for public banking and related reforms. Money creation also means that the causes of crisis and the cures for crisis are somewhat different, which he does discuss um, in uh, and flag the possibility. I just wanted to hear more about that so we could run with that uh, further with that. Proposal number two is recognizing and, un and unpacking the importance of private seniorage. Uh, if banks and other institutions are money creators, then they are reaping seniorage profits. In other words, if banks are using money creation to fund their lending, they have measurable advantages in lending compared to other lenders. As one economist puts it, banks capture the same monetary convenience premium as the government. A 19th century secretary of the treasury put it more simply complaining that banks by funding their own lending via new money were effectively, quote, getting an interest-free loan from the public. And the, my question is, how might that uh, advantage in funding have mattered over time? At least three possibilities. One is that it shapes the economy at an elemental level. Insofar as seniorage allows banks to lower lending rates, then they become the dominant lenders. Borrowers really need to get access to bank credit in particular because it is the least costly. Those borrowers then have an advantage. If so, then access to bank credit, because it is the ordained channel for new money, is potent in shaping economic activity from the very beginning, you know, from boring banking on. In short, a senior advantage, not expertise um, or competitive advantage, has been shaping distribution from the ground up. Second implication of private seniorage is that it also contributes to the power of industry. So Professor Epstein's story is one of the power of the Bankers Club. I couldn't agree more, but the question is how much of that power is enabled by seniorage profits? And if so, how should that affect the way the government treats banks? Third implication um, uh, is, uh, is the way our uh, attitude towards seniorage shapes modern expectations. So when knowledge of private seniorage was wide or spread, so was the notion that banking was a privilege. Banks had to give up something for that privilege. That included putting reserves at the Fed. It didn't include getting interest on reserves at the Fed. Those reserves instead were, uh, they, banks were lucky to have them there, right? That it allowed public support to banks. By contrast, 2008, the Fed starts paying banks interest on reserves that interest is eventually institutionalized as a mode of administering interest rates. 2023, the SVB crisis, we have an exacerbation of that regime with the Fed. The Fed now opens facilities to lend money at low rates to banks. 
who put money, who put that money into reserves at the Fed, and are then paid a higher rate of interest by the Fed than they're paying to borrow money from the government uh, in the first place, a kind of internal shell game. And the question that follows is, you know, how might we adjust our approach? Surely this is a function of the lobbying power of banks, but it's also a function of our collective amnesia about how banks function, including their enjoyment of private seniorage. The last point I make, I'm sure I'm very close to the 10 minutes, is my third proposal. Implicit throughout the book is a battle for economic theory as well as popular knowledge. And I would love to hear more here. Economics as a discipline structures models in ways that obscure how money is created and issue, issued, and those models matter enormously. So capture, I would say, is not just political a remunerative, a matter of incentives, but also a matter of knowledge. Uh, and I'd love to hear Professor Epstein on how we teach more, how we revise the way we come at banking um, and, and, and create counter theories, really counter um, paradigms to the current uh, micro and macro economic theory. A, a big agenda for Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much, Christine. And now I will turn it over to Dean Baker. Dean. Thanks a lot, Bob. Uh, I really appreciate being on here and uh, reading Jerry's book and being among old friends and, uh, and of course, talking about one of my favorite topics. So let me see if I can get my screen up here. Uh, State slideshow. Okay, so I, I obviously appreciate Jerry's book very much. I've uh, had occasion to talk about these issues with Jerry over the years, more years I'd like to think about, as well as uh, Bob and the other panelists here. Um, and it's great to have a chance to talk about this. And what I want to say, again, I think very much in keeping with Jerry's view on this, I'm a big fan of boring banking. And I, I actually carry it a step further. I, I think we have to think about um, finance as what it is. And, you know, I often say I, I don't really want to challenge economists on their theory. I want them to apply it. And the way you'd apply it here, finance is an intermediate good. You want, it's not like healthcare, It's not like housing. It's, we want as little of it as possible. We need it for the economy, no doubt about it, but it doesn't provide, it's not an end in itself. It's like the trucking industry. And I think it's very useful to think about finance like the trucking industry. If we had the ever expanding trucking industry and people getting tremendously rich trucking, we'd be going, what the hell is going on? And that's exactly how we should think about finance. Okay, so I've got four topics I wanna to go through today. Um, I think most of these are dealt with in one way or another in Jerry's book, not the Franken Amendment, but uh, the first one, financial transactions, taxes. Bob's written more on this than anyone, but you know this is, I think, a very simple, straightforward thing, taxes to reduce the volume of trading. Secondly, public provision. Again, Jerry touches on this in this book at several points. Um, public provision is often for some items. Uh, I mentioned Social Security and health care insurance. It's much more efficient than it's, it's not a moral issue. I mean, you could raise moral issues, but it's much more efficient than the private sector in providing these goods. Um, the third Franken Amendment, I guess most people probably don't know about this. This was an amendment that was uh, proposed in Dodd-Frank. It passed with 65 votes in the Senate. It got killed in, in the conference committee. I mentioned not because it's so important, but I think it's just such a great example of the sort of corruption that Jerry talks about. And it really just, you know, it, 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 I'll give it quickly, but uh, you'll, you'll see the point. And the last one is converting corporate income tax to the tax on stock returns. This is something I've been sort of fascinated about for, I don't know, a number of years. And uh, I just thought this is a great opportunity to talk about it, throw it out there, um, see what people think. Okay, so first one, financial transactions taxes. Um, we, we want financial markets, you know, it's not a question we're against financial markets. I mean, that's nuts, but financial markets are supposed to be about raising capital. Again, this is a textbook. So this isn't, you know, commie socialism, whatever. This is textbook capitalism. You want financial markets for, for companies to be able to raise capital. It's not for speculation. Um, again, you can gamble, um, you know, insofar as people gamble, fine. They gamble in lotteries, gamble in casinos. I'm not a uh, you know, prude, let them gamble, but tax them. You know, that's what we do in financial money, in, in uh, lotteries, we do in casinos, we actually have very high taxes. Um, we're talking about a very modest tax. So again, we've, you know, you could bat along how, what the range of taxes, uh, when we talk about taxing uh, financial transactions, usually it's in the range of 0 0.1, 0.5%, UK 0.5%, others, you know, have proposed lower taxes. It doesn't really matter, lower taxes on other, other assets other than stock. 
But the point is, we'd be talking about relatively small taxes. And, you know, the issue here that it's going to somehow shut it down, shut down the markets, you could make two points here. One is, you could just say, well, it used to cost much more, simply the transactions cost much more before we had modern technology, you go back 30 years or so, the transactions costs on Wall Street were considerably more than what they would be today if you had a one-tenth of a percent tax on stock trades. It'd be close if you had five-tenths. But the point is that they, they didn't shut down. We had very vibrant financial markets. The other point is just that if, if you have a tax on two-tenths or one-tenth of a percent or even five-tenths of one percent, what does it tell you? Just be an economist. If that would stop someone from trading, obviously that trade wasn't expected to be worth very much. And, you know, the last point here that it would raise a lot of revenue for the government. Again, range of estimates, half of 1%, possibly 1%, depending how you structure it. And what's really neat, at least in my book, is it essentially raises the revenue by reducing the volume of trading in, in the financial market. So instead of people paying money to brokers and other actors in the financial markets, they're paying the government. That's, that's great, you know, and then those people who are conducting the trades, they can do something useful instead. Good, it's a win-win all around. So big fan of that. And uh, again, Jerry has mentioned this in a book. It's a, to my mind, great policy. Um, doesn't happen for obvious reasons. Not the, not the, uh, not, not bad on the merits. Um, second issue, um, public provision of key services. Uh, Social Security, I've had more occasion to work on that than I'd like to, like to imagine. Um, the cost of administering Social Security, it's about a half percent of annual payouts. You know, so if you just look, and this is straight from the Social Security Trustees Report, Dad is right there. So what does it cost to send out the checks every month? Um, it's about half of 1% of what they pay out each year. If you look at private sector funds, and, and we have these, so this isn't speculation, it comes to 15 to 20%. Um, so the idea that, oh, we're going to replace Social Security, everyone's going to have their own account, and uh, that's going to be great. Well, it's, it's 15 to 20% if you add up what people pay in fees for the those funds over the life of the funds. And, you know, I've had a lot of arguments. I remember I was debating some guy from Cato many years back and he's going, oh, social security is old fashioned, one size fits all. And I go, I'll take that one. You know, it's old fashioned like the wheel, you know, and one size fits all. Yeah, because we want to, this is about giving people core retirement income. So we're not telling people they can't save on top of that. They can't have an individual account. That's great if they're in a situation to do that and they want to do that. But this is to make sure that someone who spent their lifetime working can enjoy a decent retirement. And it does it incredibly well. And, you know, again, you can't say, I think, enough good things about Social Security. Um, Medicare, you know, this is, you know, done, does this for the elderly, people over 65, for the disabled. Again, it's incredibly efficient relative to private sector alternatives. So, and again, the data is right there, the trustees report that comes out every year, and you can find other places too, but, you know, costs are about two and a half percent of benefits. By contrast, private insurers cost are around 20% of benefits. And then on top of that, everyone who's had the misfortune to have to deal with the healthcare system, which is just about all of us, um, your pro providers have to hire all these staff to deal with the different insurers. So when you add, add that in, it could easily be 25 even 30% of benefits. You're paying an awful lot of money to people to administer the healthcare system. We want our money going to the people who are providing healthcare, to the doctors, the physician's assistants, the nurses on down the line, not to the people who are shuffling paper. So again, this is just a straight efficiency argument. Um, we want people to get healthcare. That's a you know, moral argument. I think most of us are in that boat, but just on efficiency grounds, we should all want national healthcare insurance. Getting from here to there, we know many of us have been in on those battles. It's a long road, but that's politics. That's in the power of the, the industry. That's not efficiency. That's not economics. Okay, the Franken Amendment. This, is, this dates back uh, to the financial crisis. One of the things that was going on, and this is hardly a secret, it was widely talked about, it was talked about even during the time, but after the collapse, you had massive, you had a massive secondary market. So what was going on was you had the issuers uh, of mortgages and often very bad mortgages, some private mortgages, all day mortgages. They issued mortgages that they knew were trash. They had people, they, they told people to lie. I don't want to blame the lenders, the borrowers. I mean, in some cases, I'm sure they deserve blame, but they told people to lie. They, they said, oh, put down, you know, someone says their income's 50,000, put down 150. Um, they told people to lie. They knew they were garbage mortgages and they didn't give a damn because they knew they could sell them in the secondary market to the investment banks the very next day. So they didn't give a damn. So why would the, why would the banks buy mortgages? They're not stupid. We're talking about Chase Manhattan, Citigroup, you know, the rest of them. They're not stupid people. 
people, why would they buy mortgages if they know are garbage? Well, they buy them because they know they could bundle them in a mortgage-backed security and sell them off anywhere in the world, which they did. Well, how are they able to do that? Are they able to bundle these and sell off these junk bonds? Well, they're able to do that because they call in Moody's and Standard and & Poor and Fitch, and they get them to give them an investment grade rating. Well, why would Standard and & Poor and Moody's do that? Well, they do it for a simple reason. They want the business. So they knew that if they rated them poorly, that they wouldn't be called back by Citigroup or by, by uh, Merrill Lynch or whoever it was. So they had an incentive basically to lie. So how do you counter that? Well, you have a third party select the rating agency. And this is what the Franken Amendment was about. It was saying that the Securities and Exchange Commission would, would select the rating agency. So Goldman or, or whoever it might be, they want an issue rated, they call up the SEC, they say, send over someone. It, it gets rid of the agency problem, the, 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 the moral hazard problem. This passed the Senate with 65 votes, bipartisan support. At that time, I think the Democrats had 59, and not even all the Democrats voted for it. I think some were absent, I forget the exact vote. But the point was there were a number of Republicans voted for it. It seemed like a very inoffensive way to do anything. It's not socialism. It's just about getting the system to work right. Well, what happens was passes again, 65 votes, gets killed in the conference committee. What happened was Geithner got in touch with Barney Frank, who of course was the big actor on the House side. And they said, oh, we can't have this. Let's change it to an SEC study. We'll have them issue a study. And then after, I forget, six months or a year, they'll, they'll either implement the Franken Amendment or the implement was concluded in the study. Well, it was classic. There are hundreds of comments in the study, almost all from the industry. And almost nothing on the other side, because no one was on the other side. No one could afford it to, to analyze this on the other side. There were a few, but not many. And what was great was, you know, again, I didn't try to read through all the comments. I read through some of them. They're all pretty much the same. The main thrust of the comments was that the SEC may send over someone who's not competent to evaluate an issue. Now, just think about that one for a second. Oh, Dan, can you try to wrap up? Can you try to wrap up? Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Okay, so, so how could they send over someone who's not competent? They're calling the rating agencies. If they send someone who's not competent, they probably shouldn't have the issue. So anyhow, needless to say, it got trashed. So I'll skip the stock returns, taxing stock returns, and just say, in, say at the end, we, we can rein in the financial sector. We need economists to think like they believe in economics. Unfortunately, they don't. And you know, as Jerry writes very well in the book, the system is incredibly, incredibly corrupt. Sorry for going over. Okay, thank you so much, Dean. Um, just, I'll just say, uh, if anybody wants to write in questions, um, now is the time to start doing it because we'll have uh, Jennifer and Lisa, and then we'll have a, a general discussion. So, Jennifer Top. Thanks so much, Bob, and thank you, Jerry, uh, for inviting me to speak about your excellent book. It's an honor to be among these panelists. I have three things I want to talk about, but before that, I want to draw on comments that uh, both Christine and, and, and Dean made. Christine mentioned the social compact, uh, as did Jerry, that is supposed to underline uh, our entire uh, financial system ever since the Roosevelt era when there was maybe even earlier with the creation of the Fed, but at the very least with the creation of uh, deposit insurance um, and other safety nets such as the Fed for at least the traditional uh, deposit taking banking system. The notion was we're going to protect your downside. We will rescue your institutions. Um, but in, a, in exchange for that, uh, you know, because there will not be uh, in theory, you know, runs on the bank um, we on, on the other side, you're going to have to contribute to extending credit to the you know to the to consumers and to businesses and so on. And we saw um, we saw that and as as also as part of that, given that you're going to have this um, the the the, uh, the backing of the U.S. government to protect your your balance sheets. We also, the, the thinking was that the federal regulators um, and Congress would have a say in both what the um, what the asset side, the type of loans and the types of investments these banks would make, um, as well as the types of deposits that could be taken in in term, terms of the duration, as well as the maturity mismatch, right? All of that kind of made sense. Um, and that was part of 
the bargain in the 1930s, which, um, as Jerry talks about in his book, gets eroded through um, deregulation uh, throughout the um, you know late 70s and early 80s. Um, and through the competitive rise of, at the time, then the shadow banking system, which would have been, for example, the money market mutual funds. Now, um, I believe that, uh, you know, we talk historically about that social compact and how uh, the bargains weren't met, but then it was with Dodd-Frank, the enactment of Dodd-Frank in 2010, that it's sort of like um, the, the vows were renewed. You know, it's sort of like having a new wedding ceremony and the, this, the, the vows were renewed. And I think about this uh, being encapsulated in something Ben Bernanke said in the summer of 2009 when he was making the rounds in these sort of town halls telling people, well, you know, George Bush and then later the Obama administration, you know, we're really bailing out the banks because we wanted to. His metaphor was... Um, you know, when the, you know, when the elephant, you know, when the elephant, you know, falls, all the grass gets crushed as well. And the goal was to, you know, end too big to fail, to, you know, shrink the size of these element, elephants and so on. Um, and as we know, uh, that didn't happen. And uh, all of us, and then now to draw on Dean Baker's uh, um, comments, you know, Dean was talking about a kind of well, we told you so. This is something we wanted that didn't get enacted. And so I want to bring into one of those, which was one of the things that we really wanted to get into Dodd-Frank was a pre-fund um, so that if there was another, if there was risky behavior because we saw that the banks weren't going to be adequately capitalized or if there was a sort of um, intersection or contagion from the shadow banking, you know, deregulated sector into the regulated sector and there was going to be um, some FDIC or Fed or congressional intervention to prop up the failing institutions so there wouldn't be further contamination, we thought, why shouldn't there be a pre-fund where the banks in advance, when they were healthy, could put in about $150 um, billion? And of course, uh, that didn't happen. And even after uh, the Obama administration, when we believed um, we believe that there wasn't enough done in the in, in the Dodd Frank legislation, as we all know. Uh, the Trump administration, as well as a bipartisan Congress, rolled back some of the most important protections in Dodd Frank. Um, and in, in particular, having the systemic risk uh, regulation uh, for institutions with assets of more than uh, fifty billion, they raised it to two hundred fifty billion, and lo and behold, banks like Silicon Valley Bank grew really, really rapidly um, and grew to the point that they still were not, you know, above 50 billion, but below 250. So they were sort of out of sight. Now, of course, we can also blank, blame the San Francisco Fed because they could have done more. But the point is, of course, the bailout happened. No one was supposed to call it a bailout. Um, and of course, if there had been this prefund, I believe $150 billion prefund, perhaps the other large banks would have been, uh, you know, trying to stop some of this, but or at least we would not have had to dig into the deposit insurance fund and so on. Now, um, my, my last three things, which I, I, I want to talk about most importantly, is the unique contribution I believe Jerry made with this book. Um, he is telling um, a kind of micro history, in addition to sort of the big sweeping history and the details about what got us to where we are, when it comes to the Dodd-Frank era, the reform era from, you know, 2009 um, on through the implementing uh, regulations, Jerry um, really names names and gives credit to these institutions that developed, including Americans for Financial Reform, uh, which Lisa Donna will speak about, which she, she continues to lead, as well as Better Markets and others. And I think what's really important here is to the extent that Jerry's solution of multiple levers need to be pulled. Um, these are institutions that will continue and endure and train folks, uh, not just on the history, about, but about where those levers of power are. There are people who have written about political entrepreneurship, including John Coffey, um, drawing on the work of politi uh, uh, political scientist Mansur Olson. Um, but unlike those abstractions, Jerry actually tells us who the people are and what they did. And I, and I really thank him for that. Um, I also want to address, um, I guess I'll bundle these together, but we, I really firmly believe here that people matter. People matter in terms of who is hurt, you know, who the losers are when banks get out of control, but also who benefits um, and who enables. And here Jerry talks in chapter eight about the financial regulators and their lawyers. 
Um, it is it was calamitous, the orchestrated attack on the nominations of both Sarah Bloom Raskin and Sally Amarova to lead the OCC. Um, we know that uh, personnel is policy. It's something Elizabeth Warren um, often repeats. And we have often, those of us who are in, in Jerry's parlance, those of us who are club busters, who have been critics of the banking system or any systems of oppression are often accused by those in power of being complainers with no good ideas and no good plans. People like Sarah Bloom Raskin and Sally Amrova have the knowledge, have the plans, um, but what they didn't have is a political power, and um, they're, they're, uh, they were forced to essentially withdraw. Um, I also want to talk on the, on the flip side um, of the, uh, the, um, the folks who uh, benefited. You look at someone like Jamie Dimon, who is still the head of J.P. Morgan Chase. This is someone who claims that, uh, that they somehow, what did he say, missed missed, I put that in quotes, the fact that housing prices, the asset uh, at the center of these toxic mortgage, toxic mortgage linked securities, um, that housing prices would go up forever. You know, this kind of nonsense. This is someone who was able to make money, um, socialize the losses, privatize all the profits, make a ton of money, stay in power. And now today is in a very dangerous um, position of being one of these folks out at Davos, I'm um, thinking, you know, saying things like, you know, Trump and authoritarianism essentially isn't that bad. Well, again, not bad for people like him. Um, I remain somewhat hopeful um, because folks like conservative uh, commentator Bill Kristol actually said recently after hearing that, um, though, though he is someone who believes that free markets, that, that capitalism is better than socialism, he said, um, you know, free markets with a welfare state and some regulation is far serious, far better um, than a government economy, economy with little room for freedom. OK, that's fine. You would expect that. Um, but he said, but if capitalists, namely these bankers, side with authoritarians, better social democracy than corporate authoritarianism. That leads me hopeful. OK, the very last thing, though, what makes me not hopeful, what makes me distressed is on January 10th, the Securities and Exchange Commission um, approved in a vote of three to two, their very first um, spot Bitcoin exchange traded product. Um, though they had previously approved uh, Bitcoin future or crypto future type products, this is an utter disaster. Um, they didn't have to do it. This flies in the face of everything Jerry talks about in terms of the precautionary principle. And I encourage folks, I don't have a lot of time here to talk about it, but I encourage folks first to take a look at Carolyn Crenshaw's statement. Um, this is what it looks like, dissenting from the approval. Also take a look at Gary Gensler, the chair's lukewarm approval um, of this. Uh, you know, this is a blueprint for sort of saying, well, we told you so, uh, but Gary Gensler should have used his power and vetoed this. Um, you know, this, uh, it, it's outrageous um, that the SEC is putting its stamp of approval um, I think it's it's not um, in okay, keeping try to with wrap up. could you try to wrap that, up? It's, sure, not in keeping with what the regulations say, and notwithstanding a DC Circuit Court opinion, which they're claiming back them into a corner here, this does not protect investors whatsoever. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. And now our final commentator, Lisa Dong. Thank you, Lisa. Oops, remembered on mute. Thanks. Uh, well, congratulations, Jerry, on an excellent book, and and thanks for it. I enjoyed reading it, and I want a lot of people to read it. I'm particularly grateful for the telling of this kind of big picture story about how much the rules of finance matter, um, how the masters of finance seek to control them, and that it's possible, even if very difficult, to fight back and win. From an organizing and advocacy perspective, it's very, very important to tell all those parts of the story. Um, and there is a tremendous amount at stake to Judge Jennifer's uh, second to last point about the very big picture. I don't think there's any way to build a fairer economy or a fairer society to effectively fight economic or racial injustice without taking on the bankers club and repeated failure to do so is one of the things that does open the door with authoritarianism. So it couldn't be more important. It's not gonna be the most cohesive 10 minutes of talking I've ever done, but a couple of things the book made me think about um, mostly from an advocacy perspective, including two fights we're in the middle of right now, which reinforce one more time the story about the Bankers Club and the harm of its impact on the policy process. 
first on crypto, your Dracula image really, I think is was very uh, apt and important. I have to say it feels particularly frustrating to be facing the combined impact of the astounding levels of spending by the industry. Those sports endorsements, lots of political money. They're pushing of fake stories about inclusion and decentralization and democracy. And uh, the fact that at least some of the actors who were paying a little attention to combating the harms act now like the threat must be over, given the FTX collapse and other obvious problems in the industry. Unfortunately, it should be over, but it most certainly not is not. It, it's been an incredibly important defensive victory thus far that we have succeeded in keeping them from getting legitimizing and exception creating legislation passed. But the threat is very serious. Yeah, it's an absolute priority for Health Financial Services Committee Chair McHenry. And on the Hill, there's a lot of we must have some new rules, which sounds reasonable, but isn't right when the rules uh, are worse than letting the current rules work, including magnifying the dangers of greater in interconnectedness with the rest of the banking system. The fact that we and our allies and a set of stalwarts on the Hill and elsewhere have held out thus far, uh, you know, we've done good work, but also, uh, and the, the product is obviously deeply flawed um, and people are starting to experience uh, getting ripped off and losing money. Uh, but also, I think, to an item that Jerry talked about a little in the book, which is to some division in the industry, including within pieces of the crypto industry itself and between crypto and the banks. The problem with the Dracula phenomenon is that the longer they're able to keep rising from the dead, the longer the different sectors have to figure out how to work together, do business together, and those divisions disappear. And there's so much at stake, because it's really partially a Ponzi scheme, in keeping the bubble floating um, that, um, that Dracula effect is very powerful. Second fight we're in the midst of around capital rules, a very modest proposal really out there to implement you know, from the prudential regulators to implement in the US the so-called Basel endgame, improve some of the ways capital is calculated, undo some of the Trump era deregulation, which Jennifer talked about, the wrongheadedness of which was made so very obvious in the 2023 bank failures. And it is being responded to with a major lobbying blitz by the big banks who don't want any bit of their ability to privatize the gains and socialize the losses of excessive risk taking or any bit of their stock buyback programs curtailed, taken away. They are running ads saying that the capital rooms will harm small business lending, even as they fight, for example, to get rid of new rules that would actually track small business lending, in particular to business owners of color and women. They have an army of lobbyists. They're weaponizing a very specific item around mortgage risk weights that the regulators have already said they're willing to, to address to create a fog of apparently righteous opposition to the whole proposal. Even having watched this play out again and again and again, it's kind of astounding. And you know, you put it in the context of the conversation that we've just had about like the nature of the public support for these institutions, the fight back on uh, taking this little additional modicum of responsibility uh, for their own stability is astounding. The two more general things that strike me about the dynamics of these fights, um, one is the is the challenge, uh, sort of of the of the boringness of the story about what money and power buy. Unfortunately, it's not surprising that story, and it stops being news to the people who write about finance or it gets written about in an occasional money and politics story, but left out of every other story about the dynamic. Uh, and it's so central to how we end up with policies that reward finance at the expense of everyone else. So I really appreciate this book for focusing on it. I think that it's really important for us to keep insisting that it be part of the story, not just sometimes, but all the time, because it is part of the story all the time. And then there's the ways in which in the same lies get repeated over and over again, and nonetheless carry weight. Uh, because of the intellectual apparatus that Jerry's book describes, the paid-for studies, the repetition at nice cocktail parties and events, the checks that come from the people who say it all reinforcing each other, but also because of one additional way I think that power reinforces power in this context, which is that the businesses are explaining what impact they claim a rule will have on their business, which seems like an authoritative position to speak from, especially if you don't undercut that back to the first point about what interests are at stake. And so that our side must know less because we're not them. One takeaway for me is that we in our community to keep, keep strengthening the ways we reinforce each other's voices 
including particularly uh, reinvigorating some of the connections between advocates and scholars that was a little bit more robust in the immediate aftermath of the crisis and has attenuated a little. But I want to talk a minute about private equity and private markets, which you talk about some in the book, which we've been spending a lot of time on as the private markets have grown larger than the public markets. It's a really threatening and damaging example of the practices of Wall Street extraction taking over more and more of the economy to the detriment of workers, of patients, people seeking housing, our ability to survive on the planet. Um, so there's a need to take action. Uh, but from our perspective, it's also in some ways an organizing opportunity. Although the details of how PE works are obscure, the harms touch people directly in more and more areas of their lives, and the contradictions are obvious. I think it helps create space to talk about what bolder changes look like alongside whatever immediate demands we're focused on. And we are actually making some progress. Um, in Dodd-Frank, we had a really hard fight just to keep a simple little disclosure proposal for private equity and hedge funds in the bill. We had to, VC was in there at the start, and we had to let it go. And a 20, that little disclosure, which was just to the SEC, turned into the material for a quietly blockbustery 2014 speech from an SEC uh, career staffer about the findings of those disclosures, uh, saying, showing that 50% of the time they found material misstatements and errors to investors. They didn't do anything about it, but they did make that speech. This SEC now actually has finalized two rules, one disc on disclosure to the agency and the FSOC, which is useful for market and risk monitoring, and the other requiring things like meaningful and comparable reporting to investors on risks and returns, basic sounding, but not happening now. And these are institutional investors, not individuals. So it's a context in which this kind of disclosure really can matter to bargaining power and to how money actually gets spent. Um, along with approaches on private equity in, in particular sectors. CMS has just put out rules so the government will actually know when they're giving money to PE and REIT-owned health facilities, which they don't know now. A rule on, a proposal on rather on nurse staffing levels, which was initially discussed publicly in the context of take, talking about Wall Street's role in healthcare, and a new RFI just on corporate greed in healthcare. Uh, there's legislative proposals percolating on healthcare and PE, housing and PE, in some cases with some bipartisan interest, including in addition to the broader Stop Wall Street Looting Act, which we and others worked on developing with Senator Warren. There's so much work to do here, and I think really continuing opportunities to make progress. So I, I know CEPR has done a lot of work here, appreciated collaborating with them, and I think it's just, just an area for important attention. Including, actually, in addition, as I said, to the sort of fixes, uh, I think looking at this, the incredibly backwards approach to investment that PE represents, where workers' capital is deployed in ways that harm workers, uh, can also open a door to talking about exciting alternatives, like some of the public investment bank ideas that Professor Omarova and we and others have talked about. And in general, reminder that we need to keep talking about those big ideas, so we're ready to take advantage of crises and other opportunities. Finally, last thing, this SEC rule is also a good example, unfortunately, of one of the particularly grave threats right now, uh, which is the uh, stepped up aggressive assault on regulation from the ports. The PE investor disclosure rule I talked about from the SEC, the PE industry created a new trade association in Texas. What a surprise. Uh, in the face of that rule coming in order to challenge it in the Fifth Circuit. And their arguments threaten not just the rule, but a great deal of the agency's authority to require disclosures in many different contexts. I think the, it, the, it's clear that the agency has the authority to take action here. We, the association that represents the limited partners, like the union pension funds, filed amicus briefs, others did, but the agency will likely lose in the Fifth Circuit. And then what? There's a cost when we lose, obviously we lose the rule. Can you try to wrap up? Try yep, wrap up. wrapping up now. But the threat of this of these suits uh, is enormously in intimidating to the agencies, even where people want to do their jobs. They worry that unless they trim their sales, they'll lose the rule, but they'll lose more than the rule. Um, so to be clear, we're not always going to lose on these. Our side is side is going to win, we think, on the challenge to the CFPB's constitutionality, for example. We don't think it should cause them to pull back because it's better to have the fight visible from our perspective, but it is having that impact and we desperately need a bigger, more integrated and more resourced strategy to take on this threat. Okay, thank, thank you very much. 
So now I'm going to ask all the panelists to come back on. That was great. All of you were great. We have a lot of really interesting questions. So Aaron Medlin and I are sitting here and we're going to try to synthesize the themes because we can't get to all 15 or so questions. So what, we'll, what we've come up with in terms of big themes, uh, one is more a purely analytic question, which is to explain how do banks create money, how do public versus private sources of money creation work and have, why do they matter? Uh, in terms of uh, a, a, a second, and this is kind of the most prevalent theme of the questions. Um, when we talk about public banking, Fed accounts, uh, community cooperative, credit unions, are these viable solutions for regenerating and strengthening um, boring banking? And in that sense, there were a couple of questions along the purely political angle of this. Do we need a revived Occupy movement or equivalent in order to get these kinds of initiatives solidified politically? And then a third question, which kind of flows from the second one is, uh, how do we prevent um, um, measures that are advancing a, let's say, boring banking project? How do we prevent the, the banks from taking them over and using them to their own self-interest, uh, such as predatory lending limits and the Community Reinvestment Act? So what I'd like to do is ask all of you uh, four to comment for a couple minutes in any way you wish. Uh, and then I will turn it over to Jerry for about a five minute wrap. So why don't we start with uh, Professor Disson? Uh, I love the questions. They're really big and really hard to talk about in two minutes. I guess I would say that I do think that at the root of many problems is the way banks create money and the fact that our economic models clean them up. It's great. I'm all for that. But uh, clean up the practice, that is. I do think the models are also flawed at the outset because they don't fully um, uh, understand the design impact of moving to a system in which money creation would be done against long-term financial assets, which is the way the Fed works and also the way private banks work. At the beginning, this was done by the Bank of England in a profit-driven way, and that has informed our um, our money creation architecture since then. So I'm happy to um, to talk with people individually about the specifics of how money creation works, but I want to just follow that line to us in the time I have to the second set of questions about retail Fed accounts and public banking. I think these are in many ways structural fixes for this money design, and so I think they're great. Um, uh, I think they would change the role of banks and the the leverage that banks have in in their in the money design architecture. So uh, just one specific pitch. Public banking is local. Someone asked in the questions about Bank of North Dakota. It's accessible. There's a mass public banking. A proposal that is right along the lines of the of North Dakota's proposal, but better in the sense that it channels it would channel the use of public revenues, lending against public revenues to un, un, unserved and underserved communities. Um, it 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 can it would benefit enormously from a social movement. I think we have to all get involved. And if, again, if people are interested in the mass public banking, we'd love to hear from you. It's a Im very important proposal. So structural fixes for for real money design problems. That's what Great. we need. Thank you. Dean. I guess I'll focus on the last one about a social movement. I mean, both of us see a great social movement in Occupy Wall Street times 100, but I, I'm, I'm not going to hold my breath on that. So I just try to think of sort of what practically, okay, I'm an academic of sorts. Um, what can we do? And I, I think a lot of it's, you know, what we can do is talk about things differently. So, I mean, one of the things, they really mystify a lot of this stuff. So to me, you ask me about crypto, it's gambling. You know, I don't know why we don't talk about that. I know every time I raise that, the crypto people go nuts, which is great. I want them to go nuts. It is gambling. What the hell is it? Tax it. Tax it 1%, 2% and trade. You would wipe it out. So that's very simple. We know how to have a tax like that. Wipe them out. The other thing, you know, they, they generate fear. So I'm going back to 2008, 2009 when they had the bailouts. Oh, we're getting the second Great Depression. And I don't know how many people I asked. What is going to give us 10 years of double-digit unemployment if we let the banks go under? We have the FDIC. 
you know, there'll be disruptions. I'm not disputing that. No one in their right mind would dispute that. But what is going to give us 10 years of double digit unemployment? I could never get an answer to that. I don't know what it would be. Same thing we just had with the Silicon Valley Bank and uh, Signature Bank. I mean, I'll grant, I was for those bailouts just because I hadn't studied it closely. And basically, I'll be honest, I didn't want to see a serious disruption to the Biden economy that could threaten the recovery. But was that needed? I don't really think so. But anyhow, I think we just have to try to demystify the sector, talk about it as it is. That you know, again, Social movement would be fantastic, but I'm not going to bank on it. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Jennifer. Yeah, I'm going to um, talk about the public option piece of it. And I'm mostly encouraged by this idea. And if we could get a social movement around speaking about public options as being in the American tradition and all about choice, like reclaiming that choice rhetoric. And, you know, just to give you examples, you know, we have public option when it comes to health insurance, right? There's social security. Security. We are now excitingly seeing a public option when it comes to filing taxes, right? Just the other day, I think just yesterday, the um, IRS has is piloting in a handful of states for like sort of normal W-2 income, the ability to get a free kind of good TurboTax type filing system. Um, we have, you know, we once had, you know, as we mentioned, North Dakota exists, but we once actually had postal banking. Um, Marissa Baradarin has been a champion of that. Jerry mentioned that. I mean, I think I would love to see it, you know, in one space, exam, you know, put together all these great examples of choice, public options. We have, you know, we have a U.S. Postal Service. We also have private courier on and on and on. And I think we just have to keep pushing because I think that is the only hope for getting things like an account at the Fed or getting postal banking is just to show it's part of the tradition. It helps the private sector. They can differentiate by adding more bells and whistles, more complexity, but everyone deserves a baseline public option. Great. Okay. Thank you, Lisa. So I guess um, I'll chime in on the, I think of it, these, these questions at some level are uh, very much, they're always about power. Uh, we need to have the, you know, the right questions and the right policy answers. And then it's about power to make things happen. I think um, it's very, very true that it's a challenge of work in this space that uh, what people experience in their daily lives does not feel immediately like it's about the private equity takeover of, of America or about uh, banks being regulated in such a way that they get to take risks uh, to their own benefit and the detriment of the rest of us. It's also true that um, though we don't have the focus on this issue from movement organizations and individuals that we did in the immediate aftermath of the crisis, which was an incredibly important part of making the progress we did in Dodd-Frank, that we do have the benefit of the of people's suspicion of Wall Street and feeling and view that is well grounded view that it is wrong and harming them is pretty core. Like people do believe that, um, and and it's only that we have that reserve understanding to draw on that we're able to win any of these fights. So I think we have to um, plug away with the deliberate building of power and alliances and partnerships around the day to day fights while continuing to put big ideas out there so that we have the opportunity to move on them when openings happen because of crisis or because of uh, for, for other reasons. Um, you know, it was it was interesting. I, I talked a minute about the public investment bank idea. There was a second during early discussions about what Build Back Better was going to look like where those proposals were being entertained and where government actors were, there were some bills introduced and where government actors were really thinking about how robust a robust form of that might have included something in that direction. Then, mm -hmm. then that window closed, but it was important that those ideas got put in the ta on the table with some seriousness there. And we need to be even readier sort of the, the next times uh, those openings Thank happen. You. Okay, we're going to wrap up with the author himself, Jerry Epstein. And thank you all. Thank you, panelists, for all your excellent comments. Jerry. Yeah, thank you for all of your comments. Um, and thanks for those in the audience who are still listening. Uh, this has been such an interesting conversation, and I, I can't uh, tell you how much I've learned from it. Um, I'm just going to pick in, uh, a few of the things to talk about since we don't have time to really discuss all of them, but I hope uh, the conversation continues. The first thing I want to pick up on is something that, that Lisa said about uh, having reconnecting 
um, scholars and academics and, ex and so-called experts with the people who are really on the ground um, actively trying to change these policies, people like Lisa and Better Marcus and others. Uh, you know, when the financial crisis hit in 2007, 2008, Jennifer Taub and I and Jane Darista thought, you know, we don't really have this connect connection between academics who study these things and the activists. And we, we created a little group called SAFER, uh, Economists and Analysts for a Stable and, and uh, Fair and Efficient Financial Reform. Um, and we, you know, we linked up with uh, AFR and uh, tried to work with them. And that's kind of <clears throat> uh, fallen by the wayside for good reason. I mean, we didn't have the infrastructure to really keep it going. But I do think it's time to try to figure out some mechanisms mm -hmm. to reconnect all these you know, great ideas that you all and others uh, um, have about uh, these big and small issues and to see how we can reconnect with Lisa and, and others in the field. So that's, I think, one takeaway from, from a, lot of, a lot of this. Uh, the second point I, I want to make is that uh, I think over the years, a, a lot of us who've been working in, in this space have tried to figure out ways to make complicated things more understandable. So, you know, crypto, what is that? And Dean's idea, well, it's a Ponzi scheme. Okay, that's good. I mean, we, we need to figure out really clear ways of, of making, making it obvious what is, what is the problem with some of these things. And we need to teach this in our, in our classes. We need to write about them. And so that's, that's something that we all do, but uh, just encourage more people to, to, to do that, number two. Number three, um, the public options. Absolutely, I completely agree with everything that's been said about that. That's why I tried to make public banking a, a core aspect of the proposals I had in my book. And um, I, I've learned so much from people working in this space. So Chris, Chris and the work that they've done in, in mass public banking has just been terrific. I really strongly encourage people to contact Krista Sand to find out about what, what, you're do, what they're doing here in Massachusetts. It's, it's really excellent. But again, I think the Bankers Club is fighting back. And I don't know if Chris has any good ideas about how to fight back against the Bankers Club, but that seems to be the common experience with public banking movements around the countries, is that the banks say, well, it's going to hurt us. It's socialism. It's going to be corrupt. Um, and we have to come up with ways of really fighting against those, those um, arguments. Finally, in, at a slightly more theoretical level, uh, uh, Chris's challenges about you know, the money supply process and, the, and how that thinking about that is really helpful in, in um, making a number of the points that I was trying to make in the book and, and giving us a better understanding how banking works and finance works. I completely agree. In fact, Chris has been my teacher on this. In my slight defense, I tried to write this in more in the book, and I found that I didn't know how to write it in such a way to make it understandable to a, to a common reader. And so there are fragments in the book, you know, the money spigot and the underlying uh, structure of endogenous money and so forth. But I didn't fully, I wasn't able to fully take it on board, even though I, I tried. So I think. Chris has given me the, my marching orders for my, for my next intellectual endeavor, which is to try to integrate uh, these ideas more fully into the work that I do. So, so thank you for that. But let me just end by saying, um, I so appreciate the incredible work that you're all doing. Um, Lisa, Jennifer, Chris, Dean, Bob, who uh, um, has, has done, uh, been just a moderator here, but of course he does enormous work in these areas and um, encourage people out there in the audience to uh, join the Club Busters, get involved. We, we, need, we need all of your efforts and thanks very much. Okay, thank you, Jerry, and, and we'll end on that. I, I should just mention that in the interim, since I, Aaron and I, Aaron is sitting here, there's Aaron, uh, summarizing questions, there's been about 10 more that have come in. So what I would really, I, it's great that there is so much interest and enthusiasm. And of course, we can all com continue to communicate. And thank you all for you know, your outstanding thoughts and perspectives and the ongoing work that you're doing. And thank you all for joining us. And everybody get Jerry's book and go for it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Oops.
<laughs> they finished right on time. Thank you, Sean. Oops. <laughs>